has fashioned a coherent multi-department linguistics program at this university. Um, the presence here today of so many linguistic students and faculty is a testimony to that achievement. This is not an easy feat. It's often hard to achieve coherence within a single department as opposed to a multidisciplinary department. Mark is also a very effective and humane uh, student advisor for the linguistics program. It's amazing how she remembers every student, the courses they took, their graduation dates, and where they went. In return, the students all love her and seek her classes and her advice in all things linguistic and professional. She's also a wonderful colleague with whom I've enjoyed working for over 25 years. Um, she being at, at, at Wayne. She supported the Humanities Center over the years. She was one of the first faculty to win a faculty fellowship, as she did in 1995 for her project among history at, as preserved and recreated in oral culture, the linguistic evidence. Um, and she's given two previous Brown talks, one in 2008 and one in 2009. The 2009 one was, uh, one was the, the history of Southeast Asian numerical system. Uh, she's participated in, in uh, a working group entitled The Social and Structural Implications of Language and Immigration. So consequently, I mean, you can understand how sincere I am when I say it is a pleasure and an honor to welcome to the podium my friend and colleague Martha Radcliffe, who will speak to us today on the history of negation margin in Mount Green. semester when everybody is so busy. Um, I uh, am happy to share my thoughts about negation marking and Hmong Mian with you today, which are preliminary and are uh, certain to be wrong in certain respects, but perhaps you can help me with that. Um, I'd like to say at the outset, for those of you who may not know, that Hmong Mian is uh, one of the five families of languages in southern China and northern Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, it's a very busy place, a very busy part of the world, linguistically speaking. Um, Hmong Mian languages is the smallest of the five families, but it's right in the middle of the area. So it is surrounded by the other families, the great uh, uh, Chinese group to the north, west, and east, the Tibeto-Burman group to the west, the Austronesian group to the east, the Mon Khmer group to the south, and Hmong Mian is right in the middle, sort of in the same place where Thai Kadai is, the family to which Thai and Lao belong. Uh, they overlap to a great extent, but uh, the Thai Kadai languages are slightly to the south of the Hmong Mian languages. So at any rate, if you're a historical linguist, it's a very important family to work on because it's in such a high traffic area, it's been in contact with all of these languages for millennia, and um, it uh, presents a lot of interesting historical puzzles, such as the one I'm going to talk about today. Um, one of the things I'd like to say about uh, coming to this topic is it raises the question of how anybody finds a topic to talk about. Uh, our MA students are always looking for uh, MA essay topics and wanting to know how they're, how they're going to identify a good one. And um, I think many of us have 
told the students that it's largely accidental. And this is the case with this topic for me. I got an email message out of the blue from one of these uh, proto-world type linguists who was convinced that uh, there was a proto-world negative marker that had a nasal consonant. And he was looking at all the different language families of the world to confirm his hunch that, uh, that nasally marked negatives were uh, so widespread as to be uh, uh, not due to chance, but to be uh, actually a reflection of the ancient proto-world uh, negative marker. And I had to tell him that it wasn't that simple in Hmong Yen, but I didn't really know what the situation was. And his question um, actually initiated this, this, uh, this uh, particular line of research. Okay, does everyone have a, a handout? I have a few extra copies down here. Okay, the, uh, I'm going to pretty much talk from the handout uh, now. I'd like to uh, first observe the fact that uh, he wasn't crazy to think that something might have survived from proto-world if there indeed was such a thing as proto-world because um, sentential negatives are uh, surprisingly stable and resilient. Um, in language families on the whole. So English not, for example, comes from a, a Middle English not, which still survives in archaic modern English. And that comes from a compound in Old English, uh, not a thing, no thing. And that initial part uh, of the compound is, uh, can be traced back to Germanic, which in turn can be traced back to Indo-European. And Indo-European we estimate to be roughly 6,000 years old. So yeah, you can see that in the Indo-European family of languages that we're familiar with, uh, the uh, negative element has been quite stable. And then uh, in a study of 41 languages done in, in some depth, uh, which make up the, the World Loan Word database, um, the incidence of negative borrowing was very low. Um, these statistics simply mean um, that in only 4% uh, of the uh, cases was a word for not borrowed from by a language from some other language, at least the, uh, uh, the, for the languages in this database. Um, age, uh, uh, they tend to be very old. You can see we're approaching one um, here. And simplicity, they tend to be morphologically simple rather than complex. So morphologically simple, stable, old, and rarely borrowed. And not uh, is a word that appears both on the uh, 100 and 200 word Swadesh lists for the most basic <coughs> and stable words cross-linguistically, and also this revised uh, type of Swadesh list of basic and stable words um, that, uh, um, that grew out of the, loan word, uh, the World Loanword Database Project. So uh, Southeast Asia seems to be a little odd in this respect. Uh, I have a friend in Thailand who is doing a study of negation in Thai languages. And in just the Thai branch of Thai Kadai, it's a, it's a more complex family, there are six major sentential negators. And the reconstructed forms of those words are on number two on the handout. Uh, it may be possible to uh, uh, combine uh, uh, two of them, or maybe more, but you can see that they're uh, quite distinct phonologically and are probably separate roots. And then in Hmong Yen, there are at least uh, three primary uh, verbal negators. Um, they all appear before the verb. This is the primary way of negating a, um, a sentence. And um, they cannot be reconstructed uh, for a couple of reasons, so I can't give uh, reconstructions as my friend did for proto die um, uh, because uh, for the nasal negator it often changes its uh, place of articulation we say it becomes an M before uh, labials it becomes an N before coronals it becomes an N uh, before uh, velars and then it gets frozen in one position or another and you can't see the conditioning factors and so it's hard to reconstruct the particular nasal consonant that this thing was. 
Similarly, uh, there is a negator that's a low vowel. We don't know uh, the details about the pronunciation of that negator in the proto-language. And also, there is one that, has, that starts with a formal affricate, which I hear uh, uh, I'm calling T for simplicity. And uh, it either shows up as a palatal affricate or a retroflex affricate um, in a couple of the branches of the family. Uh, you'll notice that this very neatly gives you uh, not an ah, t, t. <laughs> that is a small joke, right? <laughs> this is uh, obviously accidental, but um, I've given you examples on the handout um, of how they're used in sentences in the different languages that have them, and you can see that uh, these are isolating languages and the negatives always appear directly before the verb. Uh, regardless of, of the language family. Oh, one other thing that makes these hard to reconstruct is um, these languages are tone languages, and they're actually very uh, uh, rich in tones. And we use tones to help figure out uh, earlier language states, but in this case, they're of no use at all because the tones tend to change also. Uh, because of close juncture and becomes similar to the tones of neighboring words. So we cannot tell what tones these negators originally had either. So that's why we really can't reconstruct uh, these three negatives. Um, there is a super simple picture of the family at the bottom of the first page uh, to show you where these different negators show up. There are two uh, branches to this family, uh, two subfamilies to this family, the Hmongic family and the Mianic family. On the Mianic side, uh, all languages uh, have the uh, nasal negative, um, and that's, uh, there are no exceptions to that. Um, on the Hmongic side, though, um, these languages are uh, much more diverse than the Mianic, which forms a fairly compact group. On the Hmongic side, you see all three. Uh, now, you might think that that would mean that the nasal negator is the original one because it shows up on both sides of the family, but I actually think that that is uh, not the case. Uh, okay, on to the second page. Uh, some of the problems I encountered in doing this and in thinking about this, I've listed at the top of the page. Um, I've been working with uh, grammars uh, and uh, uh, sketches of languages, most of which have been published in China, and uh, they don't give as much information as we would like. So you get word lists, and frequently in the word list you'll see the two different negatives listed in the word list, but then no texts or no discussion to explain uh, when you get one and when you get the other. So sometimes I, I will stumble on examples that will illustrate how the two different negatives are used, but sometimes uh, I just don't have that information. Um, then uh, I would mention the fact that it's very hard to uh, even identify whether or not certain negatives are uh, uh, share the same root, because these are teeny tiny words. They're very, very short. So they could be accidentally similar and not be cognate or go back to some uh, uh, original unity at all. And that is very hard to determine, especially when their tones change. And then finally, uh, Jim Matisoff suggested to me that N and A, my nasal negator and my uh, low vowel negator, might actually uh, reflect just one negative, which was na or ma or something like that that split, you know, and some languages took the, the, uh, the onset consonant and other languages took the vowel. And that is certainly possible, but there's no evidence for that. There are no languages in the family that have a ma or na type negator, and there are also no uh, varieties of Chinese in the area that have a negator that looks just like that. So uh, my questions are, you know, which one was original, and then where did the other ones come from, and how do they change places? Right? Since they all occur in the pre-verbal position, how do you get rid of one and introduce another? 
you know, given the fact that probably one of these was original and the other two were introduced later in, in history. Um, well, I've eliminated the nasal uh, as a borrowing. Uh, and I want to talk about that a little bit, which leaves us with the two remaining negators as candidates for the original proto-Hongmian negator. So um, why, why eliminate the nasal negator when it shows up on both sides of the family, which would suggest that it might have been the original one? Um, well, I think it was borrowed from Chinese. Um, because uh, so much has been borrowed from Chinese in these languages. And I've been looking at what kinds of things get borrowed. And this actually fits the profile of the types of things that get borrowed from Chinese. Moreover, there are two families of negatives within Chinese. One family of negatives starts with a, um, uh, in Old Chinese, starts with a P and is the Hu negative in, in modern uh, Mandarin, uh, and th which is the primary negator. I don't think that that's obviously where any of the Hmong Mian negators came from, but rather from the other family of uh, Chinese negators that start with an M uh, that, that appear with a W in, uh, in uh, Mandarin, yeah, either Wu or Wu. And I think that that uh, is likely to be the source because in a study of uh, Southern varieties of Chinese by Jerry Norman, um, they all, all the primary negators take a negative form, I mean a, a nasal form of some type or another. And I've given a kind of a long uh, list of the various types uh, of negators that show up. Um, and so despite the fact that according to this cross-linguistic study, People rarely borrow uh, a word as basic as not from its neighbors. I think that happened here. Um, there are a few reasons. If you look at the geographic distribution of the ends on this map, uh, you will see that they <coughs> come very close. That they <coughs> I actually plotted the ends, the A's, and the T's by latitude and longitude onto the kind of villages where the um, language that had those negators is spoken today. <clears throat> the background colors are varieties of Chinese uh, spoken in the same area. Uh, the green area is where Hakka or uh, Keja is a variety of Chinese is spoken. And the ends are always close to <laughs> one of those green puddles, you'll notice, or in one of those green puddles. Um, and I think that's probably not accidental. Even up in Hunan province, which is the furthest north uh, area, you, you find that. Um, and if you, you'll notice there's an M negative in that variety of Chinese. So I, I think the geographic distribution of the, uh, of the Chinese negator and the distribution of the Huang Yan nasal negator roughly correspond, and that looks, that looks very good. Then, um, as, I, as I mentioned, there are uh, all sorts of function words, things that shouldn't be borrowed uh, 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 by a language from another language, actually are borrowed uh, by Hmong Mian languages from Chinese, and especially uh, in the Mianic side of the family, which tends to be further east. Um, so I have a uh, I've given some examples from White Hmong, uh, the reciprocal prefix, the perfective marker, the conjunctions but and because are all clearly Chinese words, for example. Mm -hmm. So this kind of deeply embedded grammatical stuff um, frequently does come from, from Chinese in these languages. And then in Mian, uh, Mianic languages that <coughs> have only the nasal negator, um, there is an even closer affiliation with Chinese than there is between Hmongic and Chinese. So if you look at this list of words at the bottom of page two, uh, the Hmongic words in the first column are all different, uh, show different uh, roots entirely from the words in the Mianic column, the second column. And the words in the Mianic column all show quite obvious uh, uh, 
uh, resemblances to the Chinese words given in the third column. Uh, and are, uh, I think, pretty transparently loan words from Chinese. So this is, just fits the general uh, overall character of Manic languages as opposed to Hmongic languages. They just are a lot more influenced by Chinese than Hmongic languages. Okay. Then another uh, po uh, possible argument, this is more, uh, I don't know, this is more speculative, but another possible argument for the uh, relative uh, late introduction of the nasal negator is the fact that there are two languages I found that have two negators. And in each of these two languages, uh, Pahang and Bunu, uh, the uh, nasal negator is uh, less deeply embedded than another negator. So in Pahang, the uh, nasal negator is used in almost every situation except with existential and auxiliary verbs. And then you find uh, the ah negator. And in Bunu, um, the uh, nasal negator is uh, more deeply embedded. In this language, it occurs with that same subset of verbs with existentials and auxiliaries, but a brand new uh, negator that appears nowhere else but in Bunu um, uh, is used more generally with every other uh, verb. And this is reminiscent of, uh, but not exactly like, um, uh, Kuriovitz's uh, fourth law of analogy, although analogy is not involved here, uh, that the newer form comes in and takes over the uh, uh, dominant job the, of the morpheme, and the older morpheme is uh, preserved in some relic constructions that are more deeply embedded. And I think that shows that uh, in, uh, in these two languages, this uh, Bunu uh, general negative, Ndu is the newest, then N is kind of middle-aged, and then uh, Pahang shows us that N is newer than A, I believe. I think that that's what those distribution facts suggest. Okay, well, if you... Um, Well, if you buy that story, that leaves us with two negatives, and we have to figure out which of those uh, uh, is most reasonable to assume is the original one, and, and then we have to figure out where the other one came from. So, I have two hypotheses, and I'll start with the one I'm going to reject, and then I'll move on to the one that I'm going to embrace. Uh, the first hypothesis is that the one with the uh, Africa, the <coughs> cha or tia uh, negative, it's, it's G in, in uh, Quai Hmong, uh, is original, and the A uh, negative <coughs> is, uh, do I just get it? Yeah. Uh, the A uh, negative is, <coughs> is an emphatic that came in uh, later. Okay, and this is because um, this is possible because uh, in Hmong Mian, emphatic particles often come in sentence final position, and we do <coughs> see some uh, uh, particles that have that shape, roughly, and also have that function, roughly. Um, I have to, at this point, take a digression into French, <laughs> and this is the example that everyone uses of what happens with negatives over time. But uh, for those of you who haven't heard this story, uh, French originally had a preverbal negative ne, which was reinforced with an emphatic particle ba and a number of others. So not just not do, but uh, or not go, but not go a step, right? And uh, for a long time, uh, you had a stable construction with both uh, a negative before and after the verb, and now. Uh, you're losing the preverbal uh, negative, and you only have uh, the final one in some uh, colloquial varieties of French. Um, this has been dubbed uh, uh, Jespersen's cycle uh, by Östen Dahl, who is a, uh, a uh, Swedish linguist. Is it Swedish or Danish? Swedish, I think. Um, 
and uh, Jesperson came up with the idea of negatives cycling through from uh, you know a straight up negator uh, uh, reinforced by an emphatic. The emphatic takes over the role of a straight negator and and eventually needs to be reinforced with another emphatic, which then takes over the role of the regular negator and on and on and on. Uh, Jesperson thought this was because the original negator lost phonological uh, bulk and just became a little nothing of a morpheme and needed shoring up like that. Uh, uh, but in a more recent paper by Paul, Kapars Paul Kaparsky and Cleo Kondorovdi, uh, a study of negatives in Greek, they suggest that that's not really what drives this cycle of change in negatives. It's more that everybody has a communicative need to be both negative and emphatically negative. And that you need to have both types of strategies at every point. In, 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 uh, so this is not something that uh, uh, people can do without. Uh, everyone needs to be emphatically negative at times. So there, there need to be at least uh, two strategies for negation that exist side by side. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and I think that that uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, going back to, to Huang Yen, um, in uh, a form of Western Huang uh, uh, Yen, uh, uh, Miao, uh, there is a negative particle uh, that comes at the end of a sentence that's negated with the nasal negator. And it only appears in negative sentences. I talked to the man who's done field work on this language, and he says, no, you can't get that final ya anyplace else other than in a negative sentence. And, uh, but he nonetheless doesn't think it's uh, uh, negative. He thinks it's a discourse particle, which uh, makes sense. Uh, but I, you know, uh, be that as it may, there is something similar in uh, the varieties of Hmong spoken in Southeast Asia, white Hmong and green Hmong, uh, that's simply ah, and it's been described in different ways. It's very hard to describe what discourse uh, particles are doing and uh, what they add to a sentence. Uh, but this particular final ah uh, has been described by native speakers as being used to express rejection or denial. Uh, a friend of mine said, you use it when you're mad, unhappy, or dismissive. <laughs> um, another uh, uh, native uh, dictionary uh, compiler said that you use it when you don't know something, right? Uh, then in the mutually intelligible dialect Green Hmong, there is an a, uh, a, a particle that varies in pronunciation between a and a, and it is described by its lexicographer as an emphatic complaining particle, a particle emphasizing a negative answer. So, so uh, this is chipa uh, right? So this is the final a. Uh. The question I have, though, so it looks like a uh, could have been a an emphatic, uh, and that would make the t negator the original, and that the a uh, is brought in to. Uh, reinforce the original. The question is, how does it get into pre-verbal position? You know, by what mechanism do you get that final ah uh, before the verb? And I cannot come up with a plausible description, you know, going step by step that would move that ah uh, in some way, for some reason, to the pre-verbal position. Uh, these discourse particles um, uh, uh, are fixed in sentence final, uh, <coughs> sentence final position. So I just don't see how that would have happened. But for the uh, other hypothesis, I, I do have a historical scenario to propose. So <coughs> the other hypothesis is, uh, logically, that Ah was the original negator. And the T negator, on the top of page four now, was the one brought in to, to short it up in some way. Uh, and uh, there was a reanalysis re of a secondary negative construction in these languages that um, caused the, uh, the 
secondary negator, the the one with the affricate to uh, wind up in pre-verbal position, which I will go through uh, toward the bottom of the page. But before I uh, give you that historical scenario, I want to explain why I think that this G uh, word in uh, white Hmong and other related varieties of Hmong uh, could have been an emphatic or an indefinite, uh, sort of like uh, the negative polarity word anything. It can be used for what or uh, uh, something or anything in Hmong uh, uh, first, so that you can see that that sort of makes semantic sense. So first, um, oh well. No, uh, I say first, let's go back to the map. Um, again, hypothesis two is that A was the original negator and uh, T was an emphatic that was brought in. You'll see that A is kind of covers a wide range. It's down by Hong Kong, it's way up north in Hunan province, it's over in the west. Uh, so the, uh, the A negator is widely spread geographically, which is good if we're arguing for it to be the original negator. Um, it is you know, deep inside, as I say, the territory where you otherwise see the uh, nasal negator. Um, and it's in most, uh, most but not all sub-branches of Hmong. It's not in Western Hmong. Um, then evidence that the negator that starts with a coronal consonant was once an emphatic. This is um, uh, something that I heard when I was first studying Hmong back in the 80s, and I've since talked to Hmong people who say, I've never heard that, you know? So, but I know I was told uh, uh, 20 years ago or so that this was a very common way to uh, emphasize a reduplicated phrase. So in Hmong, as in all languages that have little words, reduplication is commonly used to uh, augment, for augmentative purposes and other purposes. So if you, in Pahang, if you want to say uh, uh, white, uh, really white, you double the word white, you say white, white. If you want to say super white, you will introduce an emphatic between uh, the uh, two instances of white to show that you, you're very serious about the whiteness of something. So white, very white. And in this particular uh, phrase, the uh, emphatic element that's introduced is a borrowing from Chinese, which I've, I've given there. And you can, uh, and it's one of a couple of, of morphemes you can introduce, and the, the other one happens to be from Chinese too, you know. So, uh, but it, this is just to show that that is a good place for an emphatic, is between the two pieces of, uh, uh, of a, a reduplicative <coughs> phrase. Uh, in Mien, also, uh, you see very white with uh, uh, another emphatic in the middle. Um, you can also, uh, reduplication is not only to indicate that you have more of or a more intense uh, uh, presence of some quality, but you, it can also be an undercutting kind of uh, construction. And if you introduce uh, uh, certain elements in between the two pieces of the reduplication, you can get uh, this uh, attenuating reading, so white-ish rather than very white. Um, and in that case, in yin, uh, what gets introduced looks very much like that brand new uh, negator in bunu, which I mentioned earlier, which is very curious. Um, but I, I, I can't say anything more than that. In White Hmong, uh, when I was asking uh, people about how you say very big, I would first get uh, la la, right? La is big, and la la is very big, and la chi, la is super big. And that chi is completely homophonous with the negator, completely homophonous with the main verbal negator. I thought, why do you say big, not big? in order to mean very big. And I worried about that for a long time, why anyone would say big, not big. Have you ever heard this? La chi la. Oh, you have. Oh, we have some long speakers here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, why would anyone say la chi la? That doesn't make sense. 
because you're not saying it's not big, you're saying it is big, super big, right? So, uh, but then I started to rethink what G actually meant. Uh, maybe it's not really not. Maybe it's really this emphatic thing for very, right? And then the other thing is the word for what or which or anything or something is also chi with a different tone. So in uh, the little sentence under C, chi um, right? Uh, I I don't see anything at all. Uh, that uh, first chi uh, is the negative chi, and ba C, and then da chi is anything, something, what, I don't see anything, lia, and then there is that negative discourse particle at the very end. So we kind of have three of the elements we've been talking about in the same sentence right there. Um, and it could be related. Uh, the consonant correspondences and the vowel correspondences actually allow us to reconstruct those two words, not and this what, which, anything, something, uh, identically except for tones, and I have the two reconstructions there. So, if that's the case, if A uh, was original and the G negative is secondary and was introduced, how could it have happened? And here's my little historical scenario for your uh, reading and listening pleasure. Who knows if it's right? <laughs> I hope it's right. Uh, but I, at least because I have a hypothesis, I know what to look for. Okay. Uh, the normal, number one, the normal kind of negation is preverbal, so not verb, uh, not go, not come, not see, uh, and this is true for all the languages of the family. But there is an alternate, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, not an alternate. There is a way to ask a question that involves a negative, which is probably familiar to most of you, and that is what's called the A not A question or the verb not verb question. So uh, you go not go, right, mm -hmm. is uh, one way of asking a yes no question. Uh, you present uh, a dichotomy and the hearer gets to choose. You, you answer back go or you answer back not go. Um, so the this particular kind of polar interrogative has the word not in it. Um, so, and presumably, uh, it's the same as in White Mong, it's the same uh, negative in both places. Uh, you can get, and we have evidence for truncated uh, V not V questions in these languages. So, you go not, you go not, and this is a kind of truncation you see not only in Hmong, but also in Cantonese. It's been studied for Cantonese. A, a really long, detailed article was given on when you get uh, go, not go, when you get go, go, not, when you get not go. You can get truncation in either direction uh, with Cantonese, and it's still interpreted as the, the polar uh, interrogative. So uh, then, here's the, in the square brackets, this is what is not attested. This is my you know, that cartoon where a miracle happens here on the blackboard here. <laughs> this is the miracle happens here spot in my analysis, and this is what I was looking for. There needs to be the reanalysis of a truncated question as a statement in order for the rest of this to work. And that's what I don't have direct evidence for. But if that could have happened, and I have uh, uh, one idea about uh, which suggests that that's not unlikely, uh, then we have uh, an empty slot before the verb. We have an empty slot before the verb, and all these languages uh, neg have as their regular form of negation, preverbal negation. And it's into that empty slot that we could uh, uh, introduce a word that makes sense to go along with negation, namely an emphatic. And so that's how I think G got pulled in. And uh, then if the a uh, element at the end sloughed off, you are left with only chi before the verb. So uh, at the bottom of page four, I give you a little um, evidence from uh, a dialect of Hane, which is spoken um, uh, down here. This is the down here by Hong Kong. Uh, only a few speakers, most speakers of this language now uh, 
I mean, most people of this ethnic minority uh, only speak Chinese, so there are only a few speakers of this language natively anymore. Uh, but they have uh, gone through stages two and three, so they have gone from are you going or not, you go not go, to you go not, right? Uh, is that part of the ri river deep or not? That river deep not deep can be um, uh, can be of a form that river deep not, right? So we have stages two and three attested. It's just stage four that we need. Um, now, the reason I think it's not crazy to reanalyze a uh, truncated V not V question as a statement is that we often find these discourse particles at the ends of sentences. So I, that final negative, I think, could quite easily be reanalyzed as a discourse particle, which then would leave, uh, uh, would leave a need for a new primary negator in those sentences. So I think that that's uh, kind of part of uh, uh, the process, is the reanalysis and the final leftover negative from the verb not verb construction as a discourse final discourse particle. Um, but again, I would like to have some direct evidence for this. And just a, a final minor point. Um, if this is right, um, this has implications for drawing the family tree. As you, as you uh, saw on the first page, uh, I, have not, uh, I have not drawn internal, uh, internal groupings within the two main groupings of Mangek and Mianek, but uh, uh, Xiong, uh and Meng both have this, this uh, T, negate, uh, T negator, and it, if it's an innovation, then that's a good reason to put them together on the same branch of the family tree. And that will help us, along with other kinds of uh, independent evidence, to draw a more, uh, uh, a more uh, accurate picture of the historical development of this family. OK, that's it. gives me something to look for. Okay. Um, and um, this will take looking at lots of texts. Um, often this will not be described in the kinds of short grammars that, that get published in China, so I'll have to look at texts to see if I can find it. But that, that's precisely what okay. you would expect would show up somewhere. Yeah, so looking for drawings. <laughs> OK, and the other question I had about um, T. Mm -hmm. not being the, the reconstructed one. Um, and you said that you don't see how it would shift from the position at the end to the negative position, right? To the pre-verbal position. How the ah, uh, right? If under hypothesis one, uh, she would be the, the original, and ah uh would be the secondary. And we see it in final position, but the question is, how does it get into the preverbal? From the final to the preverbal. Right. But but in but the English not underwent that kind of that kind of shift, and and uh, 
I think usually uh, the idea is that you have a, it, the negative can be an adverb. So it, it's a kind of syntactic um, analysis. So, so if it's an adverb, then sure, it can attach to the verb phrase on the right. But if it gets grammaticalized into a negative marker, then it would be associated, and, and now this is syntax, I don't know, then it would be associated with the uh, projection of info or neck phrase or something. So, so English, English not, did undergo that, right? It, the, the it was very much like the French, as I understand mm -hmm. it, yeah. where you had no before the verb, and then you had, uh, n uh, so, n not go, not wit, right? Mm -hmm. And then you lost the pre-verbal, and you wound up with just the post-verbal, and now uh, English negatives follow the auxiliary. Yes, so, so the English not sort of underwent that syntactic position change from being at the end to coming before. before. No, it started out at the beginning, right? It came before the verb. Well, it gets complicated by the rise of the auxiliary, of the do, for example. Okay. So you have to see how... Well, the two pieces got glued together. Yeah. Yeah. And then, or maybe they moved when they got glued together. Yeah. Well, this one has to move from the end up. Okay. Well, we can talk about how that okay. might have happened. I still, I still can't see it exactly. Oh, Robert. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I have a question about the, the, the three, four transition uh -huh. and the semantics of this. So, I mean, I don't know anything about these languages, so I'm not going to have evidence either way. But just thinking about um, negative polar questions, right, if you think that's what three is, you know, usually semantically negative polar questions are biased towards a positive answer. Right? You're like, you know, didn't marry eat spinach uh, is biased towards, I believe, and the speaker believes that Mary ate spinach. So in some ways, they're kind of like less negative than a normal, yeah, they're, they're, they're I'm going to say this. They, they presuppose positivity or imply positivity. So I was wondering if, the trunc if you don't have to truncate it. I would assume that it would have the same semantics as the verb, not verb. Uh, and how, how Does that presuppose either negative or positive if you ask for it? Well, if you ask just the verb, not verb, does it presuppose one or the no. other? No. Yeah, I assumed it was neutral because its source was neutral. It may have may undergo some kind of a, a change in semantics yeah. when you lose that piece. Yeah, I was um, just wondering because it's sort of like an extra step to get from a, a biased polar question to just a negative assertion to just from. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's, that's interesting. To get that information, I just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. That's. <laughs> question as to why you're calling the um, end particles, discourse particles. And the end particles? Yeah, because they seem very sentence eternal to me. Ooh. And so I'm just curious there are how, it is that they're, how, how it is that they're discourse markers and not you know, particles in the sentence. Well, they don't seem to have anything to do with tense mood aspect. Uh, there are aspect markers you put at the end also, but these are something else. <coughs> and their semantics are very squirrely. <laughs> you can, uh, they uh, are the hardest thing about long grammar, I think, to deal with, because uh, you have to collect hundreds of sentences to see how they're used in order to indirectly get a sense of what they might add. Uh, they uh, are the locus of intonation, so they don't tend to have tones of their own. Uh, so you, all of your uh, intonation, which tends to be discourse related, gets piled onto this poor particle at the end of the sentence. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I don't, why, what would you call them other than discourse particles? And they're also traditionally called that by other linguists working on these languages. Well, I was, I was thinking about um, Schiffer's work on discourse markers, where it had, the marker has a role to play in the construction of what's going on in the larger, lar larger unit. So, for example, someone can say this or that or the other thing, and then the next person can say, well, and yeah. that's a discourse marker yeah. because it's got this connection to 
to uh, the implication of a problem <coughs> They often the indicate so. uh, things like um, or hesitation or politeness or uh, uh, insecurity, at speaker attitude. Um, uh, well, those can be kind of discourse, but, but you're talking about in the past. Uh, well, you see how it was translated by the various speakers as final ah as uh, used when you're uh, to express rejection or denial, when you're mad, unhappy, or dismissive, um, uh, when you don't know something. It might be just a different definition of discourse markers from, you know, different fields, but it's, yeah. it's an interesting, it's an interesting Yeah. There, yes. Professor, thank you. What, I'm just curious, what's the, the, the history of the, the home language and writing? Oh, writing? Uh, it's written. very recent. Very recent. Since, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Hmong has been written since the 1950s. Uh, and there was a writing system introduced on, uh, you know, uh, a very good transparent phonemic writing system uh, uh, introduced by missionaries. Latin characters. Latin characters. Right. In China, um, similar, the most successful writing system was also introduced by a, a missionary, and it's also uh, using uh, a Romanized alphabet. Um, various people have tried um, other kinds of alphabets. There have been some that have been um, invented by uh, native speakers, but none of them is in wide use, other than uh, the Romanized uh, writings. Also, the uh, Chinese government um, that has developed Romanized alphabets for these languages. And you know, have tried to, to get them to uh, be used by communities with varying success. I have three different discount okay. things. The first one is, I don't think that you have to say that Koparski and his collaborator, Kandarab, uh -huh. um, negated um, disagree with uh, with Jesperson. It's, it seems to me, especially if you look at the history of French, mm -hmm. that it's all part of a much larger cycle. Mm -hmm. So that the um, the need for a reinforced negation throws, at least in French, the weight to after the verb, mm -hmm. which helps with the oh, deterioration of the young. Yeah. Um, I wrote on this a while ago. Oh, if you haven't okay. found it, I'll send you Okay, the, great. Um, the next one is that, and this one you'll, you're probably going to tell me I'm off the walls, but the use of she between adjectives, for example, could it be some kind, without having to look for no, something non-negative, could it be a kind of what Horn calls metalinguistic negation? Not just white, but white. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, I see. And therefore keep it in. I don't, what, what do you think? Um, <laughs> it's a little um, artistic. It's not used so widely anymore. Um, most people would just um, cut straight to the point. It's, um, especially like primary um, English speakers like us um, would just go straight to the point and say um, very white or white. Um, to say white, not white, is a little more artistic. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I, I'm following what you're saying, though. It's, it's a little bit of like an exaggeration and expressive, almost not so much informative. Well, the kinds of examples you get in Horn's work are things like, she's not pretty, she's beautiful. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he calls it metalinguistic. Um, but there's got to be that pause, right? Uh, you Some, know, well, in English not that pretty, has to be, Well, I, I wonder, this is really a very tight unit, you know, yeah. lot you up, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's not like it's not big, it's big. Well, it could be frozen. Uh, yeah, it could be. Right. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. And the third one is very <coughs> sort of speculative, but in English, in French, you can, it, it has to do with you not having any evidence between three and four on mm -hmm. your diachronic layout there. Mm -hmm. um, 
French increasingly allows for, uh, for questions without any kind of word order change from the declarative. Mm -hmm. And English does it also. You're done. Yeah. You're leaving. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other markers. In French, of course, which is um, syllable final stress, you don't even get a stress difference. Mm -hmm. You do get an intonation contour. But I wonder if there's something in there. If you can go the might, other way. Yeah, you exactly. Can, if, you can go. if you might think about that, because it's clearly a blurring between the two um, okay. sentence types. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would hope so. Yeah. I was just going to say that I think there's like, I was going to the same point because it's like the rising declarative sheets you were talking about, like yeah. Mary bought a guitar, right? That sort of, those questions. I don't know if people think this is where it comes from, but like in like California English where you have. All, I mean, they're not questions anymore. People just kind of talk like this. Up talk. Up talk. Up talk, yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know if, that, if that's a reanalysis of. But do you have it going up? Is there a go the other way in English? Or I can question. You can take a question with its very clear markers of word order change and everything like that being used as a well, sentence. If you think of writing the declaratives or questions, then going from writing the declarative to a question, the up talk is going from the question to the assertion. And the only thing um, I think of in French is a kind of shift in meaning of n'est-ce pas, which is a question marker, uh -huh. a tag question marker, um, to where you use it by, by itself to say, and I'm not kidding, something like that. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I think that's analogous. So yeah. maybe this, yeah. anyway, parallels there. Yeah. There's something going on in... Um, an obscure dialect of English, namely Detroit English, mm -hmm. um, that I've noticed. I've never seen anybody write about this, but I'm very much aware of it. Somebody needs to study this. There is a development of a, what do you call them, truncated alternative questions? Is that what you were calling them? Uh, yeah. The, uh, truncated verb, not verb. Right. right. Uh, mm -hmm. Which you get in Detroit English. Uh, people oh. say things like, so did, you get, so did you have a good time or no? You hear that a lot in ordinary conversational speech, where I would not be able to do that. Huh. It has falling pitch, it's a yes-no question, and it's a truncated V not V construction. Um, I don't know what you're going to do with that, if you want to do anything with it. But the problem is nobody's... I've only heard it, I've never seen anybody write about it. If I had time, I would try to collect these. I've been trying to collect a few. They're, they're all over the place if you just listen to people talking on the phone for or example. Or no. Yeah, or no, with falling pitch. Yeah, you've, heard you've heard it, yeah. It's around, I think it's regional to this region, because I haven't heard it elsewhere. And it's unstudied as yet. But it's weird. And careless if you would say or not. Yes. You know or no all the time. But, but the but fact that you use it. this at all to make a yes-no question, when English has a perfectly good syntactic construction for making yes-no questions, and you use it, and then you add this or not thing anyway. It's double marking, which of course negations like to do anyway. Yeah. Very nice. I didn't know that. I have to listen. <laughs> yeah, uh, in, uh, in Indonesian in language, we also use uh, no, uh, like a not no, and the end is a form of a question, tag question. Uh -huh. So you're not going, aren't you? So we have similar that amuti da pergi. But then we use as a no at the end as a form of tag. Is it an invariant? Yeah, so, but they are, they are both no in English, but both in the sentence we have both negative, one in the before verb, and the other one is negative at the, at the end of the sentence. To make a question. And yes, then. to make a question, like a tag question. A tag question. And in regarding as a number, like number three, we also have like a not for insertion negative, just like a doubt. Are you going or not? Mm -hmm. So just like a, you go, not. So we, we're not so sure if our uncertainty or questions we spoke to agree with us or not. Just like a uncertainty, we always use not, go, and not. Uh -huh. That's an Indonesian interpretation of a no as a double negative. No. But, okay, I, I'll ask you to write all of that down because um, my, one of my my secret, uh, not now not so secret, uh, ideas that I have uh, entertained for a number of years now is that 
Indonesian and Hmong are distantly, 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 distantly related to each other. Uh, <laughs> so, I believe by the way, the construction is, uh, they almost have the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, also, like you mentioned about the grave implication, yeah. is uh, what intensification, uh -huh. and also plurality, they are also expressed in the big implication, uh -huh. the plural form. Yeah. Do you ever put anything in the middle between the two? No. Reduplicated pieces? It's always a reduplication. Okay. You know. Both, both adjectives and and, and nouns. And that's it. So like that. it, it could be referred as a plural noun, but also can be plural or negative, plural adjectives. Indonesia has two ways of doing it. Okay, Mara, did you hear that? <laughs> she's writing. On, she's writing on non-iconic reduplication oh. for her her typology. <laughs> Oh, yeah, if it helps reinforce what uh, Professor Nathan was saying. Yeah. Uh, um, you can do it in Spanish. Too. Oh, the, okay. they, they will say what they have to say and then they'll say no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's Did the you tag. see someone? No. Yeah. So, and in German, you can say a positive sentence as well, but it changes a little bit. The negative particle changes to nishva. Uh -huh. Did you see someone? Nishva. Is that right. not true? Right. So, if it helps. Getting at things at the end, getting more stuff at the end is not difficult with these languages. Okay. It's getting stuff into the pre-verbal position. And how you get mm -hmm. these negatives into the pre-verbal position is a big mystery. If, you know, why would anyone take out a perfectly good word for not that they already have and replace it with another one? That, that's, you know, but putting extra stuff on the end uh, to make more of a connection with the hearer, that but seems they, to be a natural impulse in lots of languages. They do drop it in Spanish, though. They, yeah. It's, you saw so-and-so, no? Okay, without So they the, don't say, I you see. didn't see so-and-so, no. It's, you saw someone, so no, like the Detroit. Yeah. So it is in Hindi, too. It's a tag. So right. it, it is. works with the opposite polarity. Right, right. So for the, uh, the thing about uh, white not uh, very, uh, the duplication uh, for very white, uh -huh. So you think it's a reduplication, uh, 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 and then you search a uh, very instead of a not a. We don't think it's a not a for four. Uh, this was uh, um, from a grammar book, and okay. it was described so that way. Insert. As insert to for emphasis. Okay. Right, no, it was not described as a not a. It ends up looking like it. It does, a it does. It looks just That's like, like it. In Chinese, we can do something too with certain intonation. It's a big, not big. It's pretty big, huh? It's like that. Oh. Like, yeah. But, oh, but it's interesting. If you look at it as in, uh, a, a, not a, they, it, I mean, only adjectives, of course, can be emphasized. You don't emphasize the verb. A, not, I mean, you cannot, you cannot have this effect for verbs, right? I mean, the example happens to be an example for adjectives. Right. And we can do that only for adjectives too. I don't know. So I don't know whether it's in our age of the duplication. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was just kind of uh, passing on the description as it was given in these grammars, but it could well have been something like that. Uh, just out of curiosity, you say that uh, some conjunctions were borrowed from Chinese. Uh, uh, but because, how about ants? Is, is there a and that is tia is a, a, a mystery. I have no idea where that came from. And I, I don't know. In fact, I would love to look at, at and across the languages because they are never the same. So there is there is a conjunction and? Mm -hmm. it, it's not for a tactic attachment. Or There's tia right, right, for and, right? So, yeah, it, and it's used. Probably not exactly the same way we would use okay. and. And there's a lot of paratenses. Yeah. A lot of paratenses. <laughs> For Chinese, the conjunction it depends on whether you're conjunct nouns or a sentence of a verb. You have three different kinds. 